All right, Ben Manning, today's Tuesday. It's May 16th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barcel Sport. I feel Cheat. like the mics are hot. Yeah, they, maybe. Maybe so. What's going on? Uh, you know, nothing much. Just heading into the summer. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Nice sweatshirt, dude. Yeah, matchy-matchy twins today. Mm-hmm. So, And uh, we got one of these coming for you. Oh, Officially nice. should be here this week. It's and they, they go on. I'm trying my best. They're a hot item. They go on sale when? Friday. Nice. Yeah, so I've cool. had a lot of people DMing me about them. But, yeah, the Friday 120 hats. Sweet. Summer collection out on Friday. Go buy them. Go check out all mm-hmm. the Chicago merch, in fact. Yep. Um, all right, today we're doing a little bit of a pick six, but different kind of format. a different format, yeah, yeah. which I kind of like, too. Uh, Can I tell you something? Like news topics. Yeah. But. I just like that pick six graphic. So oh, it's like yeah, we're yeah. shoehorning in um a little history into that graphic yeah so today we're doing uh the top six battles in your mind i would say it's the battles that like kind of like changed the course of history yeah because there's you know there's been a gazillion battles Mm -hmm. throughout human history all over the world that's like the one thing about like human history it is like there's no good period everybody's just dying disease murder battles slavery everything has just been going on since we like came out of the trees mm-hmm. as monkeys even then even the monkeys I, I watched this documentary over the weekend called chimp empire on netflix oh i saw that <sighs> i didn't watch it but i saw that it's available it's i enjoyed it yeah. and they like talked and they just show like they have these two camps of chimps and they say like how different they are yeah, like chimps are fascinating so fascinating so you have like one group of chimps is like a smaller group and they're ruled by a leader who's like kind of like a good guy, and but like the males and females fight alongside each other, and and they're just like looking, you know, they're like a more, I don't know, they're more chill. Then there's this other group, like bigger group, where it's like the biggest, uh, I don't know what to call it, a, a tribe of chimps, biggest one ever recorded, has like dozens and dozens of members. And this guy, Jackson, who is just a fucking asshole. You, like, hate, you, like, grow to hate this fucking chimp named Jackson who's in charge of these tribes. And it's just like, you know what? They are not that dissimilar from humans. No. Yeah. So, fuck Jackson. But it's, like, a four-part documentary. It's very good. Chimps are very smart. Yeah. And they, like, they set up their Travis. R.I.P. Travis. And they set up their... uh, their cultures are like they it's so weird that you'd think like all of them would be like kind of similar yeah. just in different areas but it's like no like they basically have like their own like systems of belief and like government and like the one has a tyrant the other one has like a for sure yeah it's very very odd to for see sure. like how similar they are to yeah to i read us. i read a story once about how like one of the rivals that like bit the guy's fingers off so he like couldn't eat again yeah, there's all kinds like of shit like savage that. Shit. And then there was like they had this didn't one, kill them. The one group, them. the Western and Go Go's, had this alpha male who got his like one of his arms like trapped in a snare from a uh, from a poacher and sliced off his his hand. And normally they would say like in many other places that would mean death for that guy. Yeah, but they like recover and it's like yo, you're not the alpha anymore, but you can still be in the be in the club. And so and then his brother took over. And it was just, I don't know, it was, like, it was so interesting how, like, these different chimp groups behave in the same generic region, and then they end up fighting each other. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Chimps, are, uh, chimps are wild. Yep. All right. Before we get into it, though, I do want to talk about HelloFresh.com says Chicago 16. Ooh. Okay. HelloFresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys know the drill by now. Uh, flavors in full bloom over there. They uh, have chef crafted recipes that feature ripe seasonal ingredients delivered right to your door hellofresh does more than just delicious dinners though not only can you take your pick from 40 weekly recipes but you can choose from over 100 items to round out your order from snacks and easy lunches to desserts and pantry necessities everything arrives in one box on a delivery day you choose um it's just an unreal idea that HelloFresh had. I mean, yeah. I, you know, HelloFresh been around for a while mm-hmm. at this point, but it's still always like a no brainer. You don't want to be grabbing all of that. You Do you know, know how much food I have in my house right now? Yeah, probably. fucking zero. Yeah, okay. And I've and I like to cook, but it is just a pain to like plan things out, think it out, make sure you have all the stuff. Oh fuck, I forgot this one thing. 
it completely changes my ability to make the dish. HelloFresh takes all the guesswork, all the legwork, everything out of it for you. Yeah, or you buy too much. You're just stuck with a bunch of cilantro, and it's like, what am I going to do with this? Dude, and you I, feel bad I've, throwing I've, it out. So. I've been at war with big cilantro on Twitter for a <laughs> long time. Why are you selling me a bushel when all I need is a few leaves? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you also save money. Uh, it's cheaper than grocery shopping, and it's 25% cheaper than takeout. I'm surprised by that. Takeout's so expensive now. Crazy. Um, so... No worries if you're not a pro in the kitchen, though. They will uh, help you get it figured out. With uh, They make it so easy. Exactly. Yeah. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Chicago16 and use code Chicago16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That is HelloFresh.com slash Chicago16. And use code Chicago16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. I learned to cook by watching my girl Giada De Laurentiis. <laughs> uh, this is a way easier hands-on way to learn how to cook way easier yeah way easier i wish this was around when i was in my early 20s yeah right yeah all right first battle of the top six most important battles according to chief yeah according to me nobody else because we're gonna have some like one of them i threw in there just because i'm reading a book right now that and it starts off with it so that's that'll be a little bit later down the road but we'll start off with an american one which everybody knows and this is like you know this is a bit of like I don't know if I want to call it fantasy, but it's like a, a, a what would happen if kind of situation if, if and, and why they're significant. So we're starting off with Gettysburg, right? So everybody knows the Battle of Gettysburg. Even Ed. Remember the Titans. Remember maybe. the Titans, yeah. Shout so out Coach Boone took the boys for a run. Inspirational in that fog when they're, hey, we're getting up at four in the morning. We're going to Gettysburg. He gives a great speech. And um, that was like one of the bloodiest battles uh, in American history, maybe the bloodiest battle in American history. So casualties on the Union side, uh, 23,000. On the Confederate side, 28,000. And that battle took place uh, July 1st through July 3rd, 1863. So the war had been going on for a bit. And Robert E. Lee, who was a commander, commanding general of uh, the South, the Confederates, he decides, I'm going to go on the offensive. You know, we're going to bust out of Virginia, and we're going to go up there, and we're going to have like a major – um, a major victory. And like, they had to have this victory because if they just played defense and waited for the North to come down, they, they were going to get crushed because the North had more people and they had more people coming all the time. Because those, if you've seen gangs in New York, as an example, they Irish immigrants coming over, like, Hey, here's a cup of soup and here's your uniform. Go fight your, for your country. Like you're going to, like, you're immediately going to the front line. So they just had, they had more people, more industry, more money, more everything. So if they just sat back and waited, they would just get crushed under that, the power of the industry to make more guns, more bullets, more this, more that. But if they had been able to like take a big hit and go north, and if they won that battle at Gettysburg, like the whole history of the world could be different. Okay. So then that would have allowed them, first of all, it would have, it would have been like a big morale hit because that was the thing that Lincoln was always fighting against. Like, why don't we just come up with a peace tree. Let's let these fucking guys go, you know, like enough of this shit. And then there was also, if you win that battle, you know, the European powers are watching this very carefully being like, what's going on over there? Who's going to win? And just like when France came into the American revolution to knock out, uh, great Britain or England or whatever they were called then, um, they were watching and be like, can we take out the U.S. government, the, the United States government, and by tipping it for the South. And so if they had won that battle, there may have been European intervention. There's a lot of speculation that Maryland and Delaware would have seceded from the Union because they were on the north side at that point. So then now Washington, D.C. would be completely surrounded by Confederate states. And then they could just kind of march south on D.C. and Lincoln and everybody there is kind of fucked. So it would it would have like if you win that battle, you change the whole course of the war, potentially, especially because there were so many people killed. So the morale gets hit. You maybe get a boost from, you know, Spain, France, England, whoever. And then you're maybe you recruit a couple of these states who are on the border anyways, who were probably very hotly contested which side they're going to join. And then let's say the South wins that war. That's fucking terrible. Okay. So I think I blogged this like three years ago, but there was a plan um, and it was called the uh, Knights of the Golden Circle. So at the, the, the 
plan for the South after they won the war was take over Mexico, take over all of Central America, Cuba, uh, Haiti, Dominican Republic, all the Caribbean islands, and then even go all the way down and get like the northern parts of Venezuela and Colombia. And they were going to have this massive country that was all these different territories and like headquartered in, you know, in Florida too, because Florida was not part of the United States at that point. So they were going to take over all of this, you know, tropical, you know, what we think of as the Caribbean and Mexico and Central America now was all going to be under this Confederate um, system, all pro-slavery. So the reason like Great Britain had already outlawed slavery and we were like the last ones kind of fighting. If the South wins that war, you probably have slavery going on forever because they would have been able to, they wouldn't have given a fuck about Great Britain and these other European powers and their enlightenment because they wouldn't have needed them. They would have had all the source, all the resources, the sugar, the oil, you know, cause they would have had the oil from Texas and Mexico. They would have had time to build up their own industry. They would have had the agriculture. They would have had everything and they would have had their slaves. So we, it would have been like a truly evil empire in the Western hemisphere battling against the union, which would have remained, who knows what would have happened to it, but it would have had to move the capital to New York or Philly or Boston or something. But you would have had like these two dueling powers for who knows how long. Um, and one of them would be like perpetuating slavery forever. That was like a, a core of their belief. So winning that battle at Gettysburg is so huge because it effectively led to a course of history that ended slavery, at least legal, you know, like the way that we think of it, because there's still slavery going on all, all over the world now. But in the way that we think of it, based upon like racial lines, forever. So without winning that battle, you lose that battle, it could set off like this chain reaction of things where it's like the entire history of the world is different, and, and including like you have this nation state that's like the bulk of from South America all the way up to Washington is controlled by people who want slaves. It's fucking wild. To Huge think domino it. effect. Right? Yeah. It's Huge like, and that's what I mean. Effect. It's like all these, like, it's like the butterfly effect. Like yeah. you lose this battle and who knows, you know, yeah. and it was, it was like a three day long, like you said, remember the Titans, like all these people just fighting and dying and bleeding. 28,000. I mean, we lost 4,000 in Iraq. 28,000. That's so many. It's so, it's insane over, so it's like a combined, you know, at the end of the day, they're all Americans once you reunify, 50,000 Americans in three days. That is fucking unbelievable. Huge amount. Huge amount. And then, luckily, Meade, who is the general of the, of the Union, they win the war and, or they win the battle and they go on to win the war and that was like a big death nail. It was almost kind of like a, not a Hail Mary, but it was like they knew they needed a, the, to have a big strike mm -hmm. and that was it and they didn't get it and uh, and that was that. So, the, that. The, so thank God for that. Thank God for that. Yeah. Uh, number two. Number two. Battle of the Tours. Battle of the Tours. So no people, this one's probably not as well known. Um, but this one to me is, is fascinating for like the same thing, because we think of it, it changes the, this is 17th or I'm sorry, 732. So Islam becomes a religion in like 640 under the, you know, the prophet Muhammad and it takes off like wildfire. So it starts in the Arabian peninsula and in like 80 years, it's all over the middle East. It's all over North Africa and because at that point, like they had like, um, advanced, you know, they're the, the Persian, uh, fighting background. Like they, they used to be like this great empire. They had better technology. They fucking invented math. I don't know if people know that, but like the numerals that we use, like we, we hate Roman numerals. Well, that's what they were using in Rome, those stupid X's and V's and whatever our math that everybody uses now comes from, um, uh, the air, you know, from the middle East. So they move all the way across and then they go all the way up into Spain because this is after uh, the fall of the Roman Empire. So Europe is just kind of like chaotic and it's just different warring tribes and you have the barbarians in Germany or the, the Franks in France and all these different places that used to be under control of 
uh, the Roman Empire are now just like in a Dark Ages period, and they're all just kind of like the Celts, and everyone's just kind of fighting and scrappling for each other. So uh, the Muslims are like, more shit for us. Like we just, cause there's no unified front. We just move on in they go up to Spain and then they get their eyes on France. So they move over the Pyrenees mountains into France. And then they hear about this uh, place in tours that has like all this, all these riches, you know, this castle was built and whatever. And they're like, well, let's attack that. And then you had this guy's like one of the best nicknames ever. So his nickname was um, uh, the hammer. Okay. So the, the hammer Martel. So you think of like uh, game of Thrones Martel. So he goes down he's like, we got to like, you know, he like unifies his people. The, 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 they were the Franks who, you know, eventually became France, but they're like deep into like central France. This is not over the border. Like they're making headway. They're like on their way to Paris basically. And the hammer, even though he had less forces. So it was like 15, they estimate 15 K uh, to 20 K against 25,000 Muslims. They beat them in this battle and they, they kill their general. Who's this guy named, um, Abdul Al Rahman, who was like the, the general of the, of the day. Cause he was like killing everybody all across North Africa and France and Corsica and all these different places. And they, they kill them. And so the, the Muslims retreat back, uh, after like this huge battle where they lost like half of their forces back into Spain. And then eventually they, they pushed them even out of Spain. But they're saying, like, if you lose that battle, okay, Christianity just kind of dies in um, in France and maybe in England, too, because now it's like you have it was Islam would have spread all the way into Europe, probably all the way to like parts of like Germany. And they think that it might have been difficult to get it all the way into Germany. But the way that we think of Western Europe has changed forever. It's mm -hmm. all like it'll be all um, Islams. And it's like, who knows if you have like this, uh, the Renaissance, because it was just a different culture. And who knows if you have expansion into uh, North America, because you have a different culture. And who, you know, it's like, who knows what happens if, if that battle isn't um, won by Martel, the hammer Martel. And you ever heard of a guy named Charlemagne? Not yeah. Charlemagne the God, but, yeah. but Charlemagne. Charlemagne was Martel's grandson. So Charlemagne is like, called like the father of Europe. So he's the guy who kind of like unified Europe and like spread, uh, helped spread culture and art and Christianity and kind of like, um, didn't start the Renaissance, but like kind of set up a system that would allow it to flourish. So if Martel dies in that battle, Charlemagne's never born and he's never, he never unifies Europe and there's no like, you know, he was kind of like christened by the Pope himself as like, you're the guy. And it's like the entire history of Western culture is different and gone, like gone forever. It's all, it's who knows what it would look like, but it would not look like what, you know, the tales of knights and like, you know, European exploration and the enlightenment and all that. It would just be a completely different oh, yeah. world if, if they lose that battle of tours. Damn. So big time battle, Huge very battle. important battle. Um, so next one, that's the end of that. Ready mm -hmm. for the next one? Yeah, Stalingrad. Stalingrad. So people should know about Stalingrad. I never knew about it until this was my first class ever, my freshman year of college, was studying about studying the uh, Eastern Front of World War II. My, I don't know. I never studied that in high school. Like, didn't know. I was like, oh yeah, the Russians like got there. Like, we met them in Berlin or wherever we met them. And um, but this was like one of the worst battles ever. So. Germany had like a pact with Russia, like a non-aggression pact. And then Hitler was just like, nah, we're, we're coming. So they go through Poland, they go into Russia and they're on the offensive. This is in 1942 and 1943 is when this battle happened. And he had his eyes on this area called the Baku, which is, they had a shit ton of oil and they still do over in that region. And he's like, you know, if we get that, we'll be able to then just take our tanks and march north and take Moscow and knock them out. So they go into this battle of Stalingrad and they like take the city, but they're kind of surrounded. So, or there's, or it's, you know, Stalingrad surrounded and they're just battling tooth and nail like for fucking ever. You know, me Russian Russians estimated to die in that battle. Cause it's God. like civilians and everything too. 100 K 1.14 million. 
It's a little off. A million fucking, over a million people dying. A lot. Germany lost 400,000 troops, and then they had uh, a Romanian force with them who also lost 200,000. So 600,000 Nazis, a million Russians. Um, and it's like, and it was basically like if, if Hitler and his, someone could have talked him out of invading Russia, and he had his heart set on Stalingrad for the oil, but he also just wanted to fucking Stalingrad because it was named after Stalin, who was, you know, it was like they named the city after this guy. I'm going to take that city. It'd be like a big propaganda, rub it right in his face, and then you, like, break Russia as, like, your, you know, your boogeyman off to the off to the east. But if he had just been like, we have this non-aggression pact, we'll just leave Russia alone, you take that, you know, 600K troops and you fortify Europe, you, you know, like, you, it makes it almost impossible for um for the allies to really like not impossible but a lot harder for them to take normandy and and spread you know invade europe so they if you had all those extra reinforcements everywhere across italy north africa like i don't know what you do and they say that maybe if they didn't if they had abandoned stalingrad because stalingrad was like we're going to take that city and they would just blow right by it instead of trying to take it and go for the oil only and it's like the same thing. So then um, Stalin and Russia, you know, the Soviet Union would be all like panicked. And so would the allies be like, we have to, we can't wait till D-Day, till 1944 to go in. We got to go in now, 1942, 1943, and, um, and try to knock them out and try to gain a foothold now before they're ready. And if like that fails, then it's like, you know, kind of like Dunkirk all over again. You're kicked out of Europe forever. And maybe at that point, you just be like, can we just negotiate a settlement instead of like trying to just have a unequivocal victory in Europe. Like we can't beat them. So maybe we just kind of sue for peace. Like that's like a distinct uh, possibility if they had just ignored that um, or had ignored the city and it's not been so bogged down in Stalingrad itself. And who knows, maybe they get them to join their side. Yeah, you flip them. You could, and that was part yeah. of the thing too. So if he had gone down, or if the if the Germans had gone down into like the Balkans, there's like um, there's speculation that like Azerbaijan and all those all those little Georgia places in the Caspian Sea, who even though Stalin was from Georgia, like those places kind of felt like second class citizens, kind of like Ukraine did. Because uh, Ukraine, when Germany came in, they were like, come on in, boys. Like, they were, like, thrilled to see the, the Nazis come in um, because they had been, you know, they had a famine there that killed 6 million Ukrainians that was caused by the Russians. So they fucking hated the Russians. So all these other, like, little satellite regions that were taken over by the Soviet Union, Germany thought that they could have, like, allies in those regions. So if you had just gone there and been like, hey, you guys are with us, that could have just turned the whole... Different, yeah. yeah, a whole different uh, the war, and it's like does Britain fall? You know, does Britain like because now you can't invade France really? Does a battle of Britain where they're just bombing the shit out of them forever just keep going? And until Britain's just like let's just have peace, and then you have like a Nazified Europe for who knows? That's like a wild alternate history. Oh, and there yeah. is that um, I haven't seen it. But it was like an Amazon series. But like, what would have happened if if um, Hitler conquered? Yeah, if Hitler, if they had won the war. Yeah. Uh, but it's not popping up here right away. But I know it was on Amazon. I know yeah. it was on Amazon. Um, but yeah, it's like another thing where it's just like you know we think of this you know you know VE Day where we win in Europe and it, Hitler is dead. I don't think he's dead. I think we might have done that. We did. Yeah. yeah. A long time ago. Right. Yeah. South America. Yeah, He got to Argentina, whatever. But it's like, he just stays there indefinitely. And then it's like, cause he had taken over, got pushed all the way East to Moscow and you know, just took, that's crazy took, to think about. That's crazy to think about too. That is. Yeah. I mean, all these are, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Right, but, but that one's like, it hits home. A yeah. Because it's so recent. And, and as is this next one, which is the battle of Midway. Battle of Midway. So, Midway, there's been multiple movies made about this. So there's a recent one that I haven't seen. And then there was one that came out in like 1976. And it's like Charlton Heston and Henry Fonda and like all those like classic Hollywood names that you know. And it's about the Battle of Midway. And that was really seen as the turning point in the Pacific because 
they had hit Pearl Harbor, hit Pearl Harbor hard. And then as a response, they did the Doolittle Raid. And if you've watched the movie Pearl Harbor, aside from all the, like, the bullshit with Affleck and the, the love triangle, that whole the majority of that movie is built around getting ready for the Doolittle Raid, which is like, it's going to be like just a little jab at Japan, but at least we're going to hit them back after they hit Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And But like no, nothing really happened after that for six months. So they did Pearl Harbor. We got our shit together, kind of. We come up with the Doolittle Raid, and then it was just kind of like everybody just kind of chilling for about six months, like no, no real battles. Japan, kind of in like their entire history, had never lost a battle, okay? So if you look at like the far east of Asia, they were never conquered. Japan was always just Japan. So, the, you know, British had places in British, France, et cetera. They had places all over um, Eastern, Eastern Asia, um, you know, the Far East colonies. You know, Vietnam was French. So you had Indochina, all that kind of stuff. Japan was never conquered because they never let anybody in. Like, we don't want your business. Fuck off. And they were just like their own isolated kingdom. Even like the Hun, you know, like um, what the fuck is his name? Genghis Khan. And like his his descendants and people were trying to conquer, uh, go across the the sea to attack Japan, and it was like a tsunami knocked them out. Okay, so it was like you just can't you can't beat Japan. Yeah. And then they had, they had conquered most of uh, large parts of China, took over uh, you know Manchuria, took over Korea. Like Japan has just winning everything. They had just they had not lost a war or a battle in like forever. And then they had success with Pearl Harbor. So they were feeling a little bit too big for their britches. And they decided, like, hey, we're, we're going to even – they have this little thing midway. It's, like, middle of fucking nowhere. It's like I think it's, like, a 1,000 miles from Hawaii, like, northwest of Hawaii. And they're, like, if we can – and the United States has a naval base there. Like, we can knock that out and try to, like, win the war. Because at that – or at least <laughs> that was always going to be similar, like, the north for south in the Civil War. The United States always had, like, a, a better industrial base than Japan. So we would sink one of their ships. You know, we each have, let's say we each lost one. We'd, we'd rebuild five for that one. And then they would be the struggling to rebuild the one. So at that time, their Navy was double the size of ours. And they were going to come over and try to like attack midway and, and like lure us, our Navy out to sea. And then we like from Hawaii in a response and, and try to sink them. It was just like they made, you know, we're trying to get through these, but they made one mistake after another. It was like a stupid plan to begin with. If they would have just played more defense, it was one of those things where you could have like held America out and made all the stuff closer to your shores more difficult. They lost four carriers and a hundred fighter pilots in that, in that battle of Midway. And that kind of allowed the United States to go on the offensive, like unfettered would be like um, too strong of a word, but with that, with what Japan lost and what they weren't able to replace in the in the Pacific after Midway, it just allowed the United States to just be like, all right, where are we going next? And like, yeah. it's going to be hard. We're going to go to Okinawa. We're going to, you know, all these different little Iwo Jima, all these places that you've heard about um, in history classes and movies and stuff. They were able to do it m much more easily because the J Japanese were like, let's just go take Midway. Fuck them. And it was just like, and no one stood up and be like, hey, this is a really stupid idea. Like, we should just chill and, like, fortify the positions we already have. Let them have midway. There's no, nothing really strategic about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they cost them basically fucking everything. All right, this is, this is the, I don't even know how to pronounce this really because I've just been reading it. But it's the Battle of uh, Kahamarka. 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 Okay. And I'm reading this book called like it's like the River of of uh, Darkness, and it's about the first guy, Spanish explorer, who went up and over the Andes Mountains, sailed all the way down the Amazon to the mouth of it through Brazil, because they couldn't figure out how to turn back, because all their settlements were on the coast and then other places in Peru, and they couldn't get back over the mountains. So they're like, let's just go as far as we can. So no one had ever been through the Amazon until these guys, Francisco, and um, they get to the end. And they're like, well, now we got to get back to Spain. They build a boat on the edge of the. We should maybe do a full podcast about this, like we did for uh, Shackleton. Shackleton. But they build a boat on like the shores of Brazil, out of like the fucking wood that they had, cutting down trees and shit. Made some seafaring boat and sailed from Brazil 
all the way back to Spain. Huh. It's fucking unbelievable. They're dealing with like piranhas and anacondas and people like tribes in the innards of the Amazon. No food, and they just they just make it out of there. It's unbelievable. Anyways, so this that guy's boss was this guy named Francisco Pizarro, and he you've heard of Hernan Cortez, like the conquistadors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conquered the Aztecs up in Mexico. So he, this guy Francisco Pizarro was trying to. Um, he was trying to be like, I want to be the next Cortez, and I'm going to follow his playbook. So he went down, and he had heard about the Incas. They got, they got a fucking shit ton of gold down there. Go down there. So they sailed down to Peru, and they set up camp. And he come, he shows up with a hundred, like 170 men. Okay. Peru or the Incas have been going through like their own civil war, because the last time Pizarro was there, when he was there, kind of like a fact finding mission. Uh, he gave smallpox to a ton of people, but including their emperor and the emperor's eldest son. So then it was like, well, who the fuck's taking over? So they had a little civil war, and then the Incas had one guy win, and they met him in this town, Camarca, and they were like, let's just have a peaceful meeting between you know Pizarro and his guys. So we're like, everybody's unarmed, right? Unarmed? Everyone's unarmed. Cool. So they walk him into the, the center, the emperor has 2,000 bodyguards with him. Pizarro sends out a priest with a Bible to the middle of like this square. And he's like, we would like you to conform to Christianity. And the emperor is like, no, like we get, we're good. Like we're not, we're not becoming Christians just because you guys are here. And when he said no, he knocked the Bible to the ground. That was like the symbol. Like they knew he was going to say no. They had set up an ambush. So 180 people slaughtered 2,000 guards. They had they had I had outnumbered them with the guards outside the city at a level 400 to one, okay, in favor of the Incas, 400 to one. But they were so spooked, okay, because they have the guns, they got the steel, they got all this technology. So they take the emperor hostage after they kill these 2,000 people, take them hostage, and then they're like. All right, we'll give them back to you, you Incas. Give us like all of your gold. Give us give us all of it. And they're like all of it, you know. So they like mined gold. They all you know take the gold. We got to get the emperor back. They got this guy hostage, and they bring him like gold for like months, like six months. They're just like taking all the gold, putting it on boats, getting getting out of here, and then they kill him. Then they kill the emperor. Ruthless. Ruthless. Okay. And then they take over. And that because they had, you know, they had lost all these people to smallpox. They killed all the all the warriors and like the noble elite class. So they just stepped into that place. So now it's like, yeah, you guys, we killed all of your like rulers. Almost like another uh Game of Thrones thing where it was like, hey, like you're your slaves already like who are the who are the slaves like Grey Worm? Remember that guy, the shaved head guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was yeah, his yeah. name? What was Grey Worm's name? Yeah, what was his like people called? They were the uh, Dothrakis. No, no, no. The Dothrakis were like the horsemen. Yeah, I'm talking like the soldiers, the guy who had his dick cut off. But anyway, so they had they killed like the entire ruling class, and like the, the only people that were left were like the the slave uh, population of the Incas. It's so like, you guys are still slaves. You just report to us now. Go get us the rest of your gold and silver and all that. So that is how the Incas were defeated by the Spanish and how Spain got ungodly rich. And this guy, Francisco Pizarro, I'm saying that little flair on there too, I feel <laughs> like. Uh, Francisco Pizarro got all of this uh, gold and wealth and stuff was just because they set up this like unbelievable trap where they he had like, leave your 7,000 people outside the city. You can walk in with your guards, your 2,000 guards unarmed, though. They have to be unarmed. And then they just ambush the fuck out of them. What a rope of dope. Yeah. Got All them. time rope of dope. The unsullied. Yeah. The unsullied. unsullied. The unsullied, yeah. And then th that's how, like, they were able to, able to establish, like, Christianity in South America, too. No was shit. Be, was because they had no, like, power structure and religious uh, leaders because like the emperor was like a, akin to the god yeah. so you kill all those nobility and the and like the embodiment of god himself that's it like now i now now you that guy didn't want to be a christian now you guys are going to be christians yeah 
and it's still the predominant. Bro, I couldn't imagine being the first people to uh, sail the Amazon. Dude. I've seen Anaconda, dude. That fucking. It's, it's so scary. It's got to be like the scariest place in the world. Yeah. Oh, it's just, dude, I don't even fuck with like mosquitoes. Especially back in then when there were definitely more species. Oh, yeah, yeah, probably. And like jaguars and the oh, crocodile yeah. or alligator, whatever they are. Um, but they just tell all these stories. And it's like, well, let's fish for something out of the river. And then you'd be going down this set. And you know, all of a sudden you have like arrows coming at your boats. And it's like, don't oh, duck for cover. Let's <laughs> stay away from the, sh you know, like it was. Sounds like hell. It sounds like absolute hell. And then to get to the end, you exhale, be like, how the fuck do we get back to Spain? Because, like, the river was moving kind of too fast for them at parts, mm -hmm. which is why they were like, we can't turn. Like, if we try yeah. to turn back, we're dead. Yeah. So let's just see how far this river goes because no one had tried. Mm -hmm. No, Like, no one knew how big South America was So was, or the Amazon. So they just went all the way down it. <laughs> it's fucking insanity. It is. Yeah. It is. All right, the last battle, the Battle of Zoma. Zama. Zama. It could be pronounced Zoma. I don't know. Z-A-M-A. -A. Um, but this is... This is Rome versus Carthage, okay? So they were like the big rivals. This is like 200 years before Jesus. This, is, this specific battle was 202. And they were the superpowers in the region at the time. So Carthage is in uh, like North Africa where Tunisia is now. Obviously, the Romans were based out of Rome. But this was before Rome had like conquered everything. Mm -hmm. And they were like battling for superiority and a lot of trade routes and wealth and stuff throughout the Mediterranean. And... They fought a series of three wars, and that we're going to focus mostly on the second one. It's called the, they're called the Punic Wars, and you've heard the name Hannibal before, I mean, like Hannibal Lecter. But yeah, yeah, yeah. but Hannibal was like this great general, and he was from Carthage, and Carthage was this super wealthy kind of city state, um, and they were like only really motivated by money and trade and things like that. And then their rivals were the Romans and the Romans were like more, or their organizing principle was for like war and military and domination. So they were like button heads a lot. Um, so eventually Carthage was like, we, you know, we gotta knock these fucking guys out. And so they get their army together. They march uh, 50,000 people. They go across uh, into Spain, up through France, and then down into northern Italy. So they're attacking, like as before, you know, it's a long way to go. They had 50,000 men, they had 6,000 cavalry, and they had 80 war elephants. So, like, they had elephants equipped for fucking war. Okay? That's sick. And they're marching them through, like, the fucking Alps, okay? Like, the, the mountains, okay? They just keep going with these. I don't know how you move 80 war elephants. But they move them down and they're like attacking like the northern parts of the Roman Empire and they're winning like they're, you know, they're winning all along the way. And then they get they're just like they're so far from home. They're just like, we're out of fucking gas. Like they're, they are no supply lines. I like know nothing. So they decide like, all right, we're, we can't we don't have what it takes to to like lay a siege on Rome or try to sack Rome. So we're just going to like kind of go home and call this one like. A stalemate kind of and then they continue these battles for like this punic wars for like 20 years and they finally have a third one like 50 years later and carthage gets like they lose that second one eventually so they because they didn't take their opportunity to try to sack rome because they just didn't think that they had the strength left to do it so they lose that second one and the third one carthage not gets knocked out completely cities burned to the ground the whole society is dead forever and then the roman empire is like what we think of it in history, like this massive thing that conquered basically all of Europe and North Africa and whatever. But it's like, had they knocked out Rome in that second one, Rome is probably dead forever. And what that changes the whole history of the world because they were always dominating, conquering, and you know, spreading their ideas of whatever their ideas were roads you know art all this kind of philosophy all this kind of different stuff through f sheer force like you see in the gladiator they go up they got like the legions and they're just fucking killing these german guys and chopping people's heads off and it's maximus and it's that for hundreds of years the the Carth carthaginians didn't want to do any of that they just want to make money so there's the thinking is 
They never go and take over any place. They just trade and they just share their ideas and through trade. So there is no organizing principle. You guys go be Egyptians. You guys go be Greeks. You guys be Jews. You guys be whatever you fuck barbarians in Germany and the Celts and Franks, pagans. We don't care because they didn't. But like buy our shit. Like that's all they cared about. So the thinking is without Rome winning that, there is no Jesus because there is like the king of the Jews. Go be king of the Jews. We don't fucking care. There is no Pontius Pilate. There's no there's no Christianity taking over Rome because having like Jesus was never going to be like a big thing because they didn't have all they had was trade routes. They didn't have like a concrete culture and society throughout those places. So you couldn't spread religion more easily. So we if Carthage had won there's a very strong chance that Christianity just never, never takes off, never takes off. Cause you don't have like the power structures in place through like the corridors and like, Hey, like we had, um, we've talked about it a million times where they like basically like write the Bible in, in like 324 yeah. and you know, on his deathbed, um, the emperor of Rome converts to Christianity and like three something, and then they use their network of their empire to spread Christianity all throughout the empire, all across Europe. And without, if they had been defeated in 200 BC, 200 years before Jesus, there is no system, power system in place to be like, this is what we believe now. Yeah, to so get it out there. You're right. There's no, there's no centralized messaging. Like this is, this is the religion of our, of our empire now. And so it would just be, yeah, you guys do whatever you want. So you'd have all these different, like, you'd have the pagans who were building Stonehenge. You'd have the Celts. You'd have the, you know, the barbarians of Germany. You'd have the Jews. You'd have Egyptians. You'd have the Greek religions. You'd have all that shit still to this, well, who knows to this day. But you probably don't have Christianity becoming the largest religion in the world, mm -hmm. which, is, which is what happened, all because Roman beat Carthage in the Punic Wars. Damn. So it's like a big domino alternate history kind of. Yeah, that's a huge one. I episode. mean, they all are. Don't yeah. get me wrong, but like. Yeah, that's what oh, I mean. Christi that's, Christianity is like runs so much of. It's the organizing principle for at least a third of the world. And yeah. even like Islam doesn't um, dispute the fact that like Jesus was a prophet. Like they talk about Jesus, you know. So it's, it's yeah, it'd be like the whole world yeah. would be completely fucking different. Because that is like the. That is the thing that has moved the world forward in one way or another more than anything else. So crazy, crazy. No Western civilization, probably. Yeah, you know, six big battles. Six, yeah. Six Butterfly battles. effect battles, big time. Yeah. All right, Chief. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow.